Week five was full of a ton of ups and downs from teams all over the league. So we need to talk about it. Welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Football Fellas Podcast. My name is Cameron Lawrence. I will be hosting today as our host Lucas Wenzel is out, but I am joined by my esteemed colleague, Mr. Tyler Plath. And you know, we got we got a jam-packed episode breaking down a ton of different things from around the league. But before we do, make sure you subscribe, hit those notifications. If you are on YouTube with us, if you're listening to the audio podcast, make sure you give us a follow over there. But yeah, Tyler, let's not keep the people waiting any longer because they want to hear what we got to say. So let's jump right in. All righty, Tyler, we've been waiting for it all year long. We finally get into week five. So why don't you break down the first takeaway from week five? Uh, it's that you should fully fade all of our pick and picks over and under our <laughs> fantasy because someone keeps ruining the pick, the, ruining the ticket. <laughs> I've missed two in the last two weeks by eight total yards. It's ridiculous. And I can't say, and it's not me because I wasn't on the episode last Wednesday. So ridiculous. <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the first real takeaway is we need to talk about Cincinnati and it's kind of a moment of accountability because we, uh, we, we said that it was panic time in Cincinnati and uh, Joe Burrow must have heard us because he just went out and balled out. And so did Jamar Chase. But we need to ask the question, is Cincinnati back to their ways now or is this going to be, you know, kind of a, a, a bumpy road, a up and down season for the Bengals? And I, I, I just looking back at that game against Arizona, I can't put my finger on exactly what it is is that was so different between all the other games that we've seen this season and then this past week against Arizona. Mm -hmm. My leading suspicion is that it really comes down to offensive line play. And in Joe Burrow's two games where we've seen decent fantasy production this past week where he put up 24 and week two where he put up 16, which wasn't, you know, astounding but it was it, it you see 16 at a quarterback position you're like okay that's decent i guess mm -hmm. he was kept clean on at least 80 percent of his dropbacks in both of those games according to pff mm -hmm. every other game he's been kept clean at a at a 65 percent average his average completion percentage in those games when he's been kept clean at a 65 percent average 55 percent mm -hmm. So I'm starting to think that we've been blowing Joe Burrow's injury way out of proportion. I don't think it is necessarily as bad as like, oh my gosh, you can't throw the football. He, you know, this team is limited because of his injury. I don't think it's exactly that. I think what it really is, is that yes, his injury is affecting his ability to stand in the face of pressure. Like it, it is causing his performance to drop clearly by the completion percentage, but when he's kept clean, it's not necessarily the same Joe Burrow, but like Joe Burrow can be Joe Burrow, I guess. Like it, it is ultimately down to the offensive line. And I don't think we can necessarily, I guess then the question I have then at, off of that then is like, well, then does that make the Bengals matchup dependent? And I, I don't really know if that, if you can give that a definitive yes or no. But like I said, like, this season for the Bengals really it ultimately comes down to their offensive line and it held up this past week where we saw Jamar Chase put up a 50 burger and we saw Joe Burrow put up 24 fancy points yeah I think it is the question of is it just the Cardinals right because we saw with Daniel Jones put up a great half against the Cardinals um, and then we saw him you know the Giants have looked awful in, in every other game but at the same time they get the Seahawks next week who, except for that game against Daniel Jones, have been awful against the pass. They were giving up 340 passing yards a game before they saw Daniel Jones. They had three sacks on the year before they met Daniel Jones, and then the Giants fell apart. But they have that, and then they have a bye. And so I think moving forward, right, I think you can start getting back in on Joe Burrow because even if he's not fully healthy, right, even if he's not fully back, he gets to play the Seahawks where he should have another plus matchup, and then he gets a, then he gets a full week off. 
So I think he's going to coming up here, going to get time to recover. And obviously you got to love if he did, he had that great deep pass to Jamar chase for, I think it was his second touchdown of the day. Right. So you saw that, you, you know, you saw that he was able to move the ball downfield and the Bengals were all about getting the ball to Jamar chase, which should be their plan anyways. Right. If they're going to get Joe Burrow going, they should be getting the ball to Jamar chase. So, yeah. I think, like you said, Ty, I think this was kind of the step of they're starting to get back to where they were. I don't, I'm not ready to call them all the way back. I'm not ready to say that they're going to go compete, you know, for a playoff spot yet. I think we need to see it multiple weeks in a row. But I do think that this is the positive sign you were hoping for if you had either of these guys on your team. And speaking of positive signs, we got one in his first game back from Mr. Cooper Cup, who is Full go comes in with eight receptions on 12 targets for 118 yards. He had five catches on the first drive alone. He looked like he was back to his old ways. It didn't, you know, it didn't look like Cooper Cup has missed a step. Matthew Stafford looked for him early and looked for him often. And you know what? That was that was what you were hoping. If you were hoping, or if you have Cooper Cup on your team, this is exactly what you were hoping for. But on the other side of it, if you had Puka Naku on your team, this is also what you were hoping for because you saw Cooper Cup extremely involved. You saw him looking as close to 100% as, you know, or pretty close to 100% at least. And Puka was still extremely involved in this offense. 11 targets, 7 receptions, 71 yards, and a touchdown. I mean, it's not like week one or week two volume, but you're probably not going to get that even if Cooper Cup doesn't come back again. But still extremely involved. So that I mean, if from a Rams perspective, unless I mean maybe two two at well, you're not super excited about. But from those wide receivers, you're pretty happy with what you saw from either of them. Yeah, two two at well, and you know his stat line wasn't the the, <laughs> the most attractive. It was two for nine and a touchdown, and he had five targets. He still ran forty routes mm-hmm. behind Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua, who both ran, I believe, like 41, 42, something like that. So yeah. Tutu Atwell is involved in the offense. It's just going to be tough for him to get targets uh, when Puka and Cooper Cup are the guys. But I think the guy that is actually the most impacted by Cooper Cup's presence, besides Tutu Atwell, is actually is actually Kyron Williams. And I didn't think I'd. It, it hit me literally Sunday morning. I was like, wait a second. We've been seeing like six targets, six receptions from Kyron Williams. Mm -hmm. Why would Stafford need to keep, you know, throwing the ball to Kyron Williams. If he's got both, if he's got two safety valves at this point with Cooper Cup Mm -hmm. and Puka Nakua, like why would he need to throw it to him? And sure enough, we saw just two receptions, four yards for Kyron Williams. So it, 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 it stinks if you're a Kyron Williams manager because that was part of the intrigue was like, oh, he get he gets re- a decent amount of receiving work. I don't know if it's exactly going to be there anymore moving forward. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with that. It's, it's definitely going to come down, right? He had that one game with like 10 targets. I don't think we're going to see that again with these guys on the field. But I think from a Kyron Williams manager perspective, it was still – was still encouraging to see that he had 13 carries at least against the Eagles, right? Against the Eagles, you could easily just bail on the run um, and just rely on the pass. They play the Cardinals next week, so I think that's going to be another one, you know, where we're really going to see what this offense can do against a defense that's going to be a little more open than I think the (laughs) um, Eagles defense is. True. Uh, But Tyler, your next guy, probably the most explosive player on the field right now, on any field. Uh, Why don't don't you break that down for us? It's Devon Achan. Okay, like how can you go <laughs> through a week of football and not mention mm-hmm. Devon A. Chan at this point? I mean, over the last three games, the guy has 455 rushing yards. And if I did my math correctly, uh, he's only had 20 carries in the last two games combined. So he's been running the at a, at a clip that is... Uh, like it breaks every like statistical model breaks like mm-hmm. it, it like it breaks logic in some ways like it, it like Devon Achan is uh, he's priceless at this point like you can't trade him you should mm-hmm. not trade him there is no sell high with Devon Achan I mean yes he's dealing with a knee injury now he did leave the game because of this injury but i don't care like i i really don't care i get i I, just get healthy 
like get mm. just, just we need you at a hundred percent achan just get healthy okay now the it is still a split backfield okay we saw that last week against buffalo we saw it again this week against the giants it's still a split backfield with him and reem moster but it doesn't matter when you're averaging 12 and a half yards a carry like it doesn't matter jeff wilson Sure, he's coming back. The practice schedule is opening up, or that 21-day window to come back from the injured reserve is opening up sometime this week, more than likely. But how does he get involved in the game plan when you've got a Devon A. Chan and a Raheem Mostert that are just producing at an insane rate right now? Like, I I don't really think Jeff Wilson is really going to be that much of a threat unless we're proven, you know, unless we're proven wrong. But mm-hmm. Look, Devon Achan locked into your lineup every single week. Priceless, can't trade him. He, he's he is a league winner. I, I'll say it in week after five weeks of regular season football, we have found our first league winner of the year, and it is Devon Achan. Yeah, I mean he's averaging 170 total yards and two touchdowns each of the last three games. You know, I mean you just can't you just can't beat that, and he's doing it like you said on like 13 touches a game. I mean he doesn't even need the ball in his hands that much, and when you're that good. And you have Mike McDaniel's, uh, Mike McDaniel as your coach. They're going to continue to give you the ball, right? He's going to find find places for you to get in space. And they get the Panthers next week, who are the second, I think, worst rush defense in the NFL right now. So it should be just another amazing week. Week eight will be the test. Week eight they play the Eagles. Yep. And so week eight that you know that'll be kind of where the rubber really hits the road. But even then, for that you know. One. I can't wait for that one. That one's and even, so good. <laughs> and even then, I you know I would have no hesitation. Even if you put Jeff Wilson back in, right? Like you said, it do, it doesn't really matter the matchup. It doesn't matter anymore who else is in the backfield. What you, we've seen from so it's a Chan, right? It is a Chan. Yep, a Chan. Okay, so I was saying a Chan last year. It's a Chan or a, last week. It's a Chan. Um, what what we've seen from him so far, you just can't replace, right? He is. He is a second Tyree kill pretty much for this team. He totally is. And so, yeah, it, um, yeah, I, I would agree. I, I couldn't agree more that we're probably going to talk about him every single week because of just how crazy he is. I mean, he's just putting up stuff. Like you said, 12 and a half yards per carry. He is the second most rushing yards in the league right now. He's only played three games and he only has 38 carries. <laughs> it's like Christian McCaffrey right now has 50 more rushing yards than him. And 61 more carries. <laughs> he has more carries. He the carries are farther apart than the rushing yards. I mean, it's just and McCaffrey's averaging 5.2 yards per carry. Like it's just oh ridiculous my. how different he is. But speaking of running backs who are were popping off this last week, Brees Hall. He he is back. Robert Sala said, Hey, no more snap count. You know, Bree Brees has it. And I mean it Let's let's be honest. I mean, if there's any matchup to do it in, it was this it one was against the Broncos. Broncos. <laughs> right. So so we have to take what happened through the lens of they were playing the Denver Broncos uh in a revenge game for Nathaniel Hackett. So yeah, they were gonna try and do whatever they could to manhandle these Broncos. But 22 carries, 177 yards, a touchdown, eight yards per carry for Brees Hall, three catches um on three targets for 17 yards his counterpart dalvin cook six carries for 23 yards still averaging under four yards per carry i think Brees is going to make him pretty i mean he was pretty much useless for fantasy all er, anyways but now that Brees is back right i mean i don't think dalvin cook has any really any spot on a fantasy team unless you really want to hold a handcuff well and i would even argue that he's not the handcuff to have it's michael carter michael carter has out snapped dalvin cook the past two weeks yeah so, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, Dalvin Cook does not look good on the field. And when you see something from like this from Brees, you're like, okay, well, this is the guy the rest of the season. Brees is running back six in rushing yards right now. He's been on a snap count. He's running back six in rushing yards. He had two just terrible weeks, uh, week two and week three. And yet he still is averaging 7.2 yards per carry. It's A-Chan at 12.5, Brees at 7.2. And then I think the next one up is Mostert at 5.4, tied with Bijan, yeah. Or Swift is 5.7, and then it's Bijan and Mostert at 5.4, and then CMC at 5.2. So, like, we got, I mean, these two guys that we've just talked about are in the upper echelon right now of what you could ask for from running backs. I mean, they're doing, I mean, efficiency at a crazy pace. Um, Brees, 
the thing that you like a little bit more than a chan is he is going to have guaranteed volume the rest of the yep. season but w- w- what we talk about with a chan a chan's in a better offense and he's got a much better play caller for him so he's going to be way more efficient but i don't know what are, you, what are your thoughts on ty, uh, on I, ty? yeah i just <laughs> dave kluge said it best about dalvin cook uh dalvin cook is cooked okay mm-hmm. like there is no threat to Brees Hall in this backfield. And I, why it, I hope maybe people bought low on Brees Hall. Maybe, I don't know if you did. Well, you just, <laughs> you just fleeced your league yeah. mate because, uh, not saying that we're, you should expect this every single week from Brees Hall, but like, Brees is special, man. And he mm-hmm. showed, ex- and he showed it. He showed it this past week. Yeah, I mean, if you remember back to last year, he was running back seven, you know, through those first six weeks, and he barely even played week one. Uh, so, this, I mean, that's exactly what you want to see. Um, and now we're going to move into two running backs um, for our next two takeaways that struggle a little bit. I guess yours has one really good one and one who struggled a little bit more or was concerning, I guess, is how we should put it. I don't. I don't think we should say this guy struggled, but we, we should say it's concerning. So why don't you break down this Indianapolis backfield a little bit for us, Ty? So it was Jonathan Taylor's first game back, and uh, guess who popped off? Zach Moss. It's <laughs> who we thought. <laughs> it's who we thought. Well, so here's the thing. There was, uh, there was a tweet from somebody. I don't remember who it was, but it said that JT was going to be on a snap count. And he, oh, it was, uh, it was uh, Diana Rossini from The Athletic. She said that JT is going to be in a snap count and is going to get ramped up event, you know, week by week. Um, I don't think anyone expected just 10 snaps from Jonathan Taylor this week. And it, it, I have to think that was in part because Zach Moss gave Shane Steichen little to no reason to take him out of the game. I mean, yeah. Zach Moss was absolutely feasting. But having paid Jonathan Taylor now on a three-year extension, like the countdown has started of the days where we see Zach Moss producing like this. And and this backfield is gradually going to shift back over to Jonathan Taylor as he gets more and more acclimated to the game. And I said this in the TikTok, Josh Jacobs pretty much taught us everything we need to know about this. It takes a while when you have been away from the team this much and have been dealing with an injury you know, to make the right reads, to get back up to game speed, to find the right running lanes, to, you know, read the offensive line a bit when you are running to the outside, all that kind of stuff. Like there's a ton that goes into uh, an efficient running back and a productive running back. So we'll get there eventually. But in terms of Jonathan Taylor at this point, I think he's a phenomenal buy low candidate because I think if if you can find the the league mate that has him that was super hyped to have him back and now is like, well, what the heck is this? Like, I, I, when is he coming back? Well, now you should capitalize on that because like this backfield is going to become Jonathan Taylor's eventually. But then the other side of the coin is what to do with Zach Moss. And honestly, you're probably just going to have to write it out. <laughs> because you're not going to be able to trade him because everyone knows that John, or I should say, I shouldn't say everyone, but most people that are plugged in know that Jonathan Taylor is going to take over this backfield soon. So unless you can capitalize on somebody's desperation, right? Where they are like, well, Zach Moss, you know, he could have a role moving forward. sell. So, yeah. but if you like, because of that, that mentality of Jonathan Taylor coming back soon, you're probably not going to be able to sell him. So just ride it out, ride the high because man, like if we, I mean, what we saw this past week was pretty darn special, especially when you're going, when it was against a Tennessee run defense that has pretty much shut down every running back in the run game this year. Yeah. I mean, from the Colts standpoint, right? You're not going to, you're going to let Taylor kind of ease in, especially if Zach Moss is playing like this, right? But at the same time, there's going to come a time where, it's JT's backfield. Mm-hmm. JT is a guy over his career who's averaged 20 attempts a game pretty much. His last four healthy games from last year, week 10 to 13, his weekly finishes were 1, 13, 12, and 19. And in the game where he finished running back 19, they lost 54 to 19 to the Cowboys, and he was still a top 20 running back, still putting up double-digit points. So 
you know he can get it done. You know he's going to get it done. You know they're going to use him, like Ty said, because of that huge contract. It's just going to take a couple weeks. And if Zach Moss is producing, why would you rush Jonathan Taylor back? Right? Why would you try and just throw him out there, especially if Anthony Richardson is going to be out for a little bit? I think it's going to have to do with game script, uh, seeing how that, you know, like if Gardner Minshew gets in and they're down 21-0, right, it might be a Zach Moss game. Not that Zach Moss is going to run the ball a ton if they're down 21-0, but they're probably going to, you know, wait to throw JT in. But I agree. I mean, this is, you don't pay a guy $14 million to not use him a ton. So he is going to be used a ton this year. And if you can go by low of the JT managers, then you have to go by low right now. Yeah. I mean, I mean, let next couple of games for Indy, you get Jacksonville, Cleveland, New Orleans, Carolina, New England. I like a tougher stretch. Sure. But at the same time, I don't really care because we just saw Zach Moss produce against Tennessee and Tennessee doesn't allow that kind of running game or that, that kind of rushing performance. So mm-hmm. again, you gotta you just write it out with Zach Moss, JT, phenomenal by low option at this point if you can find the the panicking manager yeah definitely definitely all right before we get on to that other struggling running back that i mentioned we're going to take a quick break and hear from our friends over at underdog Today's podcast episode is brought to you by our friends over at Underdog Fantasy. Now, we love Underdog. It is the easiest place to play best ball formats, and they even have their own form of player props called Pick'em. You can make up to 20 times your money on a single night by correlating props together. Two picks will triple your money, three will six times it, four will ten times it, and five plays that all hit will multiply your entry by 20. You can even place insurance on your picks too, so if only four of your five props hit, you still get ten times your entry. And if you use our code FELLAS when signing up, Underdog is going to double your first deposit up to $100. And welcome back. Uh, oh, we switched it up a little bit. I did. I did. I did. Um, wasn't quite Lucas level, but I didn't want to quite just try and be Lucas. I wanted to be a, my own man in a return. I, yeah. Um, who would want to be Lucas? I mean, exactly. I mean, just skipping out of the podcast. Geez. Back to back episodes. <laughs> Gosh. I mean, if you guys are into commenting on YouTube, it is. You should comment all your dislike for lucas just to let him know <laughs> let him hear it well, um, don't just, yeah don't don't say dislike because yeah. we want we, we are all about the positive vibes yeah here. hatred is the better word <laughs> <laughs> anyways speaking of a guy who you might be disliking right now ramondre oh. stevenson oh. has been on the struggle bus this year last week rb 47 eight attempts 24 yards two targets and zero receptions we're talking about a guy who's yet to hit 60 rushing yards in the season he has been single digit points and ppr each of the last two weeks and he was out and he only outstamped zeke 27 to 25 and zeke saw four targets in this one but the problem with Ramondre, i don't want to call him a buy low i don't want to call him a sell low i mean i think the thing with Ramondre right now is he's a hold And the problem is, if you sell him, you're going to get nothing, right? People aren't really going to want to buy in on Ramondre because not only does Ramondre not look good, but this Patriots offense as a whole has looked terrible. I mean, they've been just absolutely blown out these last two weeks. What They lost by 28 against Dallas and then 34 this last week against the Saints. Mac Jones can't do anything. This offensive line is giving no room for the running backs. And now you see Zeke almost out targeting him. So, unfortunately, I do think that you have to hold because I don't want to buy into that either. I, I don't know if you agree with that, Ty, but I just I don't want to go and try and invest unless you can get him like dirt cheap, right? Unless somebody is saying I'm going to drop him and you can just throw your last bench spot to go get him. Then you know, then maybe it's worth it. But man, I I don't want any part of that and. He's a hold, but that doesn't mean that you should be starting him either. I mean, maybe next week because he plays Vegas, but even then, I I might do the wait and see approach with him. I I don't know how you feel about Ramondre Stevenson right now, though. Man, it's tough. I mean, you 
you look at the New England situation, you go, well, why don't they just run the ball more? Well, they have in previous games. I mean, Ramondre has had 12, 15, 19, 14 rushing attempts in each of those previous four games. But he's only been, I mean, his highest yards per carry in a game, 3.1. Like, this offensive line is doing no favors in the run game. And you look at the schedule and you're like, oh my gosh, like this is a great, you know, rest of this, uh, you know, a great schedule. Like Vegas, Buffalo, Miami, Washington, Indianapolis, the Giants, Chargers, Steelers, Chiefs, Broncos, Bills, Jets. Like that's a great rest of the season, but it, it, it this Patriots team just sucks. I'm sorry. They just suck. And because of that, it's affecting Ramondre and it's affecting really everyone else in the Patriots. I don't think there's a single Patriots player that you can put into a starting lineup for the next week or two, like including Ramondre. Like it is, I like, I think struggle bus is putting it gently. Yeah. It is. It, it's like, it's, I, I, I don't know what needs to change with new England. I can't say it's a quarterback thing because I think it's there are bigger issues than the quarterback, but it's I don't think you can touch any Patriots player with a 10 foot pole. No, I mean, I would agree. And the problem is too, uh Ezekiel Elliott has 24 less carries than Ramondre and only has 22, 22 less yards. Right. I mean, and the, Ramondre Stevens is a fourth round pick, remember. And if I'm not mistaken, is this the last year of his contract or does he have one more? Oh, he's got one year, I think. One one more year. So, I mean, I think they want him to stay as the starter. But when Ezekiel Elliott's averaging a full more yard per carry, Ezekiel Elliott has the same amount of receptions on the season as Ramondre Stevenson. It is getting worrisome that if he doesn't start turning it around, this is going to be for sure a split backfield. You know, it could be, but could be a 50 50 split right down the middle with zeke seeing the receiving work because he is a better pass blocker i just just, yeah it's and you know if zeke's taken over at this point in his career that is not a good look for you right this is not an endorsement of how great zeke has been (laughs) say how how much ramondre has struggled and just this offense has struggled as a whole i just like you can't even question or ask if it's like ineptitude by Bill O'Brien, like all like it was suspicious that mm-hmm. they went out and signed Zeke. Like I kind of get why, because they didn't really have anybody behind Ramondre, mm-hmm. but I don't think Zeke was the guy to go sign. I don't like, it, I don't understand. Like Ramondre has been frustrated. Like there was a quote beginning of the season. I think it was where he was frustrated with what mm-hmm. this offense is going to be and what his role is going to be. I just, I, you can't play any Patriots players. It's a week by week situation with them. You cannot play them. It's, it's frustrating because you know what Ramondre Stevenson can do, but for mm-hmm. whatever reason, the Patriots just don't want to use him that same way. Yeah. That's why I think he's a hold because you just haven't seen anything to make you want to buy in. But at the same time, if you have him. And he does go off. You know, I'd rather take that chance and hold on to him because you're not going to get much for him if you do sell him. But a guy, an older guy who has been playing out of his mind right now is a guy that Tyler is going to talk about. So, Tyler, why don't you let us know about Adam Thielen? What do the people need to know? Uh, Well, uh, father time <laughs> decided to give him one more year, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I Turned mean, it back. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean. We this is now the fourth straight week with Adam Thielen getting eight or more targets, and uh, I'm pretty sure he finished as a top five wide receiver this week. I think, I think I will, yeah. If you want to confirm that, that'd be great. But yep, um, four man, unbelievable. Now, part of that is because the Panthers are playing from behind, so the game script favors Thielen, but the other part of that is that there's just no one else. Like Mm -hmm. the run game is non-existent and you are choosing them between Adam Thielen, DJ Chark, Jonathan Mingo, LaVisca Chenault, uh, Terrace Marshall and Hayden Hurst. Like (laughs) you can kind of understand why Adam Thielen is kind of separating himself compared to everyone else. Now, do I think it can continue like this? 
Yes. <laughs> Let's play a guessing game. Cam, can you name? I'll, I'll help you out with hints, and we'll go. You know, five, four, three, two, one. But the top five wide receivers in routes ran this year. I'm Number gonna, five. Yeah, go ahead. Take a stab. Gonna guess Jefferson. Well, he would be number five, but because he got hurt, he's not number five. But you are he this guy that's the fifth number five wide receiver in routes ran is on the same team. So I'm gonna go KJ Osborne then. It's KJ Osborne, not Jordan Addison. It's KJ Osborne. But that's we're not talking about KJ Osborne. We're mm-hmm. talking about Adam Thielen. Number see, four. I, gotta go Puka. Well, he's tied, so we can put Puka at four. Number three is on the same team. So two two at well then. It's two two at well. Number two. I don't know who who's two. Jamar Chase, which oh, makes sense. sense. It's okay. Stud. But Adam Thielen is first. Adam Thielen is first in routes ran of all wide receivers after being second last year. <laughs> yeah, like and again, we're talking about old man Adam Thielen. Like it doesn't, it shouldn't be happening the way it is, but it is. And uh, look, he's he's locked into your lineup as a wide receiver, too, at this point. Like, the guy is going to keep running routes. The guy is going to keep getting targets, regardless of who the quarterback is. Like, we saw it with Andy Dalton. We've seen it with Bryce Young now. He's going to keep producing. And he looks like one of the best deals of the draft or of drafts this year because people thought he was going to fall off a little bit. He didn't look the same as, you know, he had used to in Minnesota. And uh, Adam Thielen said... Yeah, that's all false. Here I am as a top five or top 10 option at this point. Solid wide receiver two moving forward. For sure. I mean, I I can't really add much more than that. He's looked good and he's in an offense right now where they need him a ton and they're throwing the ball a lot. So, yeah, I will agree with that. I am going to transition us back to the running back position (laughs) and talk about Travis Etienne. We're going to we're going to go back to a bright spot on the running back position. Bright spot is in he's playing really well, but for us, I think this is this is one of our bigger misses and uh, of the offseason. And a lot of it came from the fact that we believe Doug Peterson when he said this was going to be running back by committee. Well, it hasn't been a running back by committee at all. Travis Etienne has dominated snaps. He outsnapped Tank Bigsby 73 to 13 in this one. Oof. 73 to 13. He put up 26 carries, 136 yards. Two touchdowns um, with four receptions on five targets for 48 yards. He's had three top 10 finishes on the year, and he's averaging 22 touches a game. So there was, you know, when they're pounding the drum saying, we need to add another running back. We want a running back by committee. We need multiple guys. Yeah, that that wasn't good. That was That's not happening. And that was the thing for us. We never really doubted how good Travis Etienne was, right? We, we always knew he was explosive. We knew that he could break it. But we figure the way Doug Peterson has run his teams in the past, the way that you know Tank Bigsby profiled to be a better goal line back for sure, short yardage back, that they were going to be subbing them in and out a little more often. But that has not been the case. And Ty, I, I gotta be honest, I'm, I'm thinking that Travis Etienne's got to be a top five running back rest of the season. I don't, I don't know if you're ready to put him there, but that, that, that's at least what I'm thinking. I, I don't see why not. I mean, there, volume is king, yeah. and Travis Etienne is getting the volume. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing more you can say. I mean, he's, he's a good, efficient running back. We knew that to begin with, and he's getting the volume to go along with it. And especially if he's going to be able to get four receptions for 40 yards in the passing game too, you know, there's, there's really not much more you can ask for out of them. It's, it's so weird though, because Doug Peterson has always had a committee in his backfield always. Mm -hmm. And there has been talk about like, well, Doug Peterson wasn't the play caller, at the beginning of the season and he took over halfway through a game, something like that. I don't know who was calling plays for this one against mm-hmm. Buffalo, but like, I, I don't know how you can't value ETN as a top five, top 10 option moving forward. Because again, it like they're only using him. That's it. Mm-hmm. No tank Bigsby, no D Ernest Johnson. Like it's all Travis ETN. Yeah. And he looks good doing it. So speaking of guys who look good doing it, I tell you, why don't you uh, talk to us about the Bears? Who would have thought, honestly? <laughs> who would have thought that we would be talking about the Bears who are doing really, really well on the offensive side of the ball? 
Uh, granted, it's been against Denver and Washington the past two weeks, but it's led to the emergence of DJ Moore as a top 10 option the rest of the season. I mean, it's three straight weeks with at least one score. He had three against Washington, two straight weeks with at least eight receptions on at least nine targets. I I need to watch some film on the Bears to see if it's as simple as like Fields being a one read guy or Fields just trusting DJ Moore over everyone else. And so he's kind of forcing him the ball or if it's game plan to get DJ Moore the ball, but whatever it is, it's working. It's mm-hmm. making both DJ Moore and Justin Fields much, much, much more reliable than when they than what they were the first couple weeks of the season. And I think moving forward, Justin Fields, that top five upside that we were talking about in the offseason is now all of a sudden it's back. DJ mm-hmm. Moore, all of a sudden, top 10 upside pretty much every week. I mean, it, there will be tough matchups along the way. And again, it, it's worth repeating. Denver and Washington have been struggling on defense mightily, mightily. But I, when you got Minnesota next, when you've got the Chargers after that, like, mm-hmm. I mean, this, why would you not expect the Bears to continue this hot streak that they're on on offense? Yeah. I mean, Emmanuel Forbes, so Forbes struggled the week before. I mean, this whole Washington. Secondary struggled mightily the week before against AJ Brown, continued against DJ Moore. Right. I I don't think that it's going to continue fully throughout the rest of the season, right? We're not going to see DJ Moore as a 20 plus point guy. But I do think that, like you said, you get Minnesota, then Vegas, then the Chargers. Vegas has been pretty good against the wide receiver position, but Minnesota and the Chargers are the two worst teams in the NFL right now against wide receiver position from a fantasy perspective. And They both struggle with wide receiver on the outside. So, yeah, DJ Moore should be in for a pretty good matchup against those two. So, yeah, I mean, you could look to sell high, you know, I mean, but it's depending how high you can sell. Yeah. Right. If you're going to be able to sell them for like CD Lamb, you know, I think that's something that I'd be interested in. But if it's, you know, you're moving to like DK Metcalf. Mm-hmm. With the way that DJ Moore is playing right now, and the fact that he has had 230 of G- Justin Fields' 280 pa- er, passing yards last week, I, I I wouldn't move off to a lateral move like that with how hot they've been and just how often Justin Fields is going to DJ Moore. So let's do a little name game. All right. DJ Moore is currently the wide receiver four on the season at the time of recording, I should say, because where we, we are recording this before Monday night football and Devonte oh, Adams not. could put up like 50, but yes. would you sell DJ Moore for I'm trying to, I mean, <laughs> cause you see Jamar chase, Justin mm-hmm. Jefferson, Keenan Allen. I don't think you're getting those guys with DJ Moore, AJ Brown, probably not at this point. Devonte Adams. I'd still take Devonta Adams, um, Mike Evans, or DJ Moore. That's a really good one because, right, we're talking about wide quarterbacks that are probably in a pretty similar throwing spot as far as consistency goes. I think I'm going to lean DJ Moore just because I do think at at the very minimum the target share that DJ Moore is going to draw is going to be greater than Mike Evans just because there is no Chris Scott, there is no one else there to take it away from him. Yep, C.D. Lamb or D.J. Moore. I'm going to take C.D. Lamb. I still think C.D. Lamb can bounce back. I mean, I know Dax looked awful, but I still have C.D. Lamb as probably a top seven, top five wide receiver rest of the season. Now, now instead of a name game, let's do this. It is more so of a yes or no question, but do you think you'd be able to get Amon Ross St. Brown for Mm. D.J. Moore? That'd be it. See, that that one would be one I'd be willing to throw out. If I got D.J. Moore, throw it out. See? Because, uh, yeah, I'd rather have Amon Ross St. Brown rest of the season DJ Moore, especially just looking at the offense, looking at, you know, we've seen DJ, DJ Moore spike like this before with Sam Darnold back in 2021. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we've also seen Amon Ross sustain it for a full season. So, yeah, I would, I, would try, I would try that. And would you, could you get, let's do A.J. Brown again. Could you get A.J. Brown for DJ Moore? Probably not straight up just because A.J. Brown's had two good weeks. 
but I think you could throw in a little package there to go get AJ Brown, right? Because people mm-hmm. are probably going to go, oh, they both have two good weeks, but DJ Moore has been a lot better. So, you know, you could throw in, um, let's say, throw in like a Zay Flowers. Yeah. Zay Flowers versus DJ Moore to go get AJ Brown. That's something that I would definitely do. Yeah. And one, yeah. Last, one last one. All right. Chris Olave. I would still trade DJ Moore to go to Chris Olave. And I do think that you could get him at this point because people are going to go, Ooh, Derek Carr's hurt. You know, um, I don't really, I don't want to be a part of that whole thing, but I do think that long term, I would rather have Derek Carr throwing to Chris Olave than Justin Fields throwing to DJ Moore. So I think would, I think you and I both agree that DJ Moore, while we do expect him to continue to perform, we are not going to see performances like this. So, Mm-hmm. That is the definition, ladies and gentlemen, of a sell high. That yes. is the definition of sell high. Yes, he's going to keep producing. It's not that you're just dumping him off for you know with the expectation yeah. that he's not going to do anything for the rest of the year. He's going to produce. Yeah, but, he but capitalize on the performances. Capitalize. Yes, exactly, exactly, and that's that's the thing we don't realize with the buy sell high buy low or buy low sell high and i'll admit you know i i, I said sell hot sell high and most he drops 50 i say sell high on dj Moore drops 50 but at the same time you'd rather be a little bit of a week you'd rather be a week early than a week late on a sell high i think both will both have great seasons or you know rest of the season but i think that you can find better pieces who are going to be more consistent i think is kind of what we're looking at there speaking of a guy who's been nothing but consistent sam laporta Sam Laporta has got to be the tight end for rest of the season behind Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews, and TJ Hawkinson. He said four top 10 finishes. Week five was his only week without five targets, and he scored two touchdowns in it. 40 plus yards. Uh, he had 39 in week one, but I'm going to say 40 plus yards in each game. And his floor so far has been nine fantasy points. And for any tight end not named Mark Andrews or Travis Kelsey and, or TJ Hawkinson, that is fantastic. You aren't getting that from Darren Waller. You're not getting that from George Kittle even. You are not getting that from Dallas Goddard. And he's already proven that he can put up 22, 20 fantasy points in a game. He's done it twice. I just, moving forward, he has a defined role in this offense. He was producing when Amon Ra was in. He's been producing when Amon Ra isn't in, right? And I just don't see how he can't be a plug and play in your offense right now. Like, I'd set it and forget it in your offense. Like, he is or in your fantasy lineup. You sh- you should not be con- questioning unless you have Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews, or T.J. Hawkinson. In which case, you know you you shouldn't be. I don't think you should be holding on to both of them. I think that's where you trade one of them to you know better one of your other positions. But yeah, he's. I think he's pr- as pretty close to the unquestioned tight end for the rest of the season. I there. I don't think. I don't think it's even close. I mean, like, I think if we're gonna put tight ends into tiers. Travis Kelsey is in a tier of his own. Mark Andrews, TJ Hawkinson are in a tier. Mm-hmm. So let's go like A plus, A minus, B plus tier. It's Sam Laporta mm-hmm. and only him. And then I think after that, you get into like a B minus tier with like a Darren Waller on certain weeks, with a Dallas Goddard on certain weeks just because he did just pop off for the first time this year, this past week. Mm-hmm. But like Sam Laporta, he's in a tier of his own. And that tier that he's in is one of the best tiers of all tight ends. Like you said, he's the tight end for the rest of the year. Yeah. I mean, here's the top, we'll go top eight or so tight ends and points per game. Points per game. You got Travis Kelsey, 16.8. Mark Andrews, 15.1. Sam Laporta, 14.1. Then TJ, or 14.4. TJ Hawkinson, 13.1. Then you got Mr. Cole Komet at 12 fantasy points game. Logan Thomas at 11 and a half. Then you got Kittle, Ingram, Goddard, Waller. Like, he has separated himself. He's averaging five more fantasy points per game than Darren Waller is right now. He's averaging three three more fantasy points per game than George Kittle. And George Kittle just put up three touchdowns in their last game. He's just, he's a guy that, you know, if somebody's like, hey, I got this tight end, you know, I would be treating him close to TJ Hawkins, you know, that same value. So if you can go buy low, you know, if someone's just like, uh, he's, you know, he's new on the scene, he doesn't carry the same name value. I'd play off of that because right now he should be, he should have the same value as like a TJ Hawkinson. 
um, or at least pretty, cl- you know, a little step down, right? You're still valuing Hawkinson more, but pretty close as of right now. Pretty close. All righty, guys. Well, with that, that wraps up our top 10 takeaways. If you didn't get a chance, make sure you check out Ty's um, waiver wire pickup video from yesterday before waiver wires run tomorrow. I have my buy sell video coming out tomorrow. Then we got our podcast talking about best and worst matchups. And Lucas has his must start video coming out on Friday. So again, like we say all the time, so much content for you guys. Tyler, before we go, is there anything that you would like to say to the people? No, (laughs) I had like 10,000 different thoughts in my head and I could have said any one of them, but I would have like mumble jumbled my way through it. So I will just say in the words of a wise man, keep fighting the good fight. Keep fighting the good fight. That's what I like to hear. We are the fancy football fellas on YouTube and TikTok. the FF fellas on Instagram, FF fellas on Twitter. I am at Camla FFF and he is at Tyler underscore plus. So make sure you check us out on Twitter. Make sure you check us out on TikTok or wherever you want to find our content because it is everywhere and we have a lot of it coming out for you guys. But with that, we will see you next week and deuces. Deuces.